Hi, everybody. My name is Lee Wind. I'm the Chief Content Officer for the Independent Book Publishers Association, and you've arrived at our online PubU online webinar, which is going to be an update on the Copyright Claims Board um, with Keith. Keith, pronounce your last name correctly for me. Cooper Schmidt. It's very intimidating, but just don't pronounce the F. It makes it a lot easier. Cooper Schmidt. So, Keith, um, I'm going to stop sharing my slide, and you can turn on yours, please, and we will get rolling. All right. Let me put on the slideshow here. Oh, look at that. It happens. Looks there. perfect. Okay, excellent. Uh, all right, so um, I'm all set to roll uh, and we'll get started here. So um, I just wanted to welcome everyone. I appreciate everyone's interest in the uh, in the Copyright Claims Board or CCB for short. Uh, my name is Keith Kuberschmidt. I am the CEO of the Copyright Alliance. And what I'm gonna do, just to kind of prepare everyone for what I'm gonna talk about over the next, let's say 50 minutes or so, because we'll take questions at the end, is that I'm gonna give an overview of the CCB. Uh, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to do that by providing some background information. I want to make sure everyone understands kind of what the CCB is, how it operates at a very high level. I'm not going to get into the granular details because we'd be here forever and uh, you'd be bored out of your mind, I think, probably as well. Uh, and then move on to some of the statistics because the CCB has been around now for about 18 months. And we actually have some information to share about how it's working, how people are using it and things like that. So hopefully you find that very valuable. And so that's kind of my approach, uh, gonna be my approach to the uh, to the presentation here. Um, I've got a lot of slides here, but I'm gonna walk through them fairly quickly. Uh, but from my understanding with uh, Lee that uh, you'll be able to get copies of these slides. So uh, there'll be additional information. So I don't, I don't know how necessarily you need to take notes on the slides themselves, as opposed to the, maybe if I say something that maybe it's not on a slide or something. So yeah, so that's just I'm popping gonna... in to confirm everybody will get a copy of the slides uh, with the recording on Friday. Okay, excellent. So let me first start off with a little teeny bit of background, right? Just in case you go, well, who is this guy talking about the CCB? Where's he come from? Why, why did we enlist him to talk about the CCB and not somebody else? So uh, I am the CEO of the Copyright Alliance. And what the Copyright Alliance is, is the voice of the copyright community. Um, our mission is to advocate policies that promote and preserve the value of copyright and to protect the rights of the copyright owners and the copyright creators. And the way we do that is by working with policymakers, whether that's in Congress or the executive branch or the copyright office or so on. Uh, we also file briefs in, in court representing the copyright community. But most importantly, probably for the folks who are, who are uh, uh, participating here is what we do is education. And so I really strongly encourage you to check out our website. I'll talk a little bit more at the, about this at the end, but to check out our website if you have any questions about copyright. Copyright is all we do. We have a ton of information about copyright videos and FAQs and you name it. So I want to encourage you to, um, to go check that out. Here is a smattering of who we represent. You'll see big companies, large companies. So we represent about 15,000 different organizations across a spectrum of copyright disciplines, usually the ones you think about, right? So you'll see movie studios up here. You see record labels up here, uh, book publishers and, and video game publishers and stuff like that. But you also see some organizations here that you might not associate with copyright necessarily, like the National Association of Realtors that has their MLS database that's protected by copyright or the National Fire Protection uh, Association, which has um, uh, electrical codes and building codes and fire codes. And all those codes are protected by copyright as well. And so uh, we do have a very diverse group, but they all have one thing in common, which is they rely on copyright. And you can see the IBPA logo in there too, often sort of the middle right-hand side. Um, but we also represent individual creators. These are, and we represent about 2 million uh, of them. I guess I have to update this slide, which is 1.8 million. Um, so these are the photographers and the performers, the songwriters and software coders, uh, artists and authors, and, and really all this new generation of creators, those who might blog and things like that, and, and just many others who make their living through creativity, okay? So uh, hopefully that all makes sense. You have an idea where I'm coming from here, what, why we're interested in the CCB, and frankly, why we were one of the biggest advocates to create this CCB. 
Um, and so let me give a little bit of background about the CCB, right? It's the Copyright Claims Board, the CCB for short. You'll hear me call it the CCB throughout this just because it's easier. And because I'm from Washington, D, work in Washington, D.C., and we use acronyms for everything, right? A good example of that is the bill that created this CCB is called the Copyright in Alternative Small Claims Enforcement Act, or the CASE Act for short. And that was enacted back in 2020. I remember sitting at this desk at home, you know, and, and you know, trying to get this passed. And it was a little strange feeling because we were in the heart of the of the pandemic at that point. And as opposed to me being up on Capitol Hill, because they wouldn't let us up there. Um, and then it eventually launched in 2022 uh, because the Copyright Office had to do a lot to create this new court, this new tribunal out of whole cloth. Um, and so what is the CCB? It's located at the US Copyright Office in Washington, DC. It is a voluntary alternative to federal court. Prior to the creation of the CCB, if you had an infringement claim, you wanted to bring it, you had to go to federal court. Federal courts had exclusive jurisdiction over copyright infringement claims. That is no longer the case. You now have this option of going to a small claims court. And the idea is that this is balanced uh, between claims by copyright owners and copyright owners, users, as we will talk about. And we'll also talk about the different type of claims that, that can be brought. OK, so that's a little bit overview with the CCB. Let me give uh, what I would consider to be the key components of the CCB, okay? Um, uh, number one, most important, it is voluntary. If you are a copyright owner, you do not have to use it. No court can make you use it. You can still go to federal court if you want. You can uh, seek uh, uh, mediation or, or some other type of ADR, or you can do nothing, frankly. So uh, it's just really another tool in the toolbox. It is voluntary for, claim for claimants for copyright owners. If you are a, what's called a respondent, in other words, the person who is alleged to have infringed something, it is also voluntary. And that means that you can opt out. The respondent can opt out. They don't have to participate. And you probably have a lot of questions right now, but hold those questions. I will get back to what it means to opt out in a moment. Let me go through the rest of this list here. It is simplified and streamlined. So the idea was to try to make this small claims court as simple, as easy as possible. So if you're an individual creator or a copyright owner of some sort, you do not need to hire an attorney to represent yourself because honestly, the biggest cost associated with bringing a case in court is hiring that attorney and paying that attorney. So the idea is to keep these costs low, make it simplified, and, uh, and, and you, so you don't need to hire an attorney. You can even like use a law student or 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 maybe find a, a volunteer lawyers for the arts to do this pro bono, perhaps uh, consistent with the idea of keeping costs low. There's no travel required. Everything is done remote or electronically. So if there's something you need to send in, you don't have to you know deliver something in paper. You do it online. Um, it's remote. If there's a if there's a, some type of conference that needs to be done, it's done through video, just like we're doing here. So we, you know, the costs are lower there. I've talked about uh, no need for attorneys here as well. Um, and the other thing I'll mention is that the remedies are capped. So it is a small claims court after all, right? So you can't get as much in damages as you could if you were to go to federal court and there's no injunctions either. But once again, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that in detail uh, later. So one question I get from people is, oh my God, why is this voluntary? This is, remember I said I'd talk about opt out a little bit more later. Well, here's here's the later. Um, because it seems absurd, wait a minute, why would you allow an infringer to decide whether they get sued or not, right? And the simple answer is the U.S. Constitution requires it. The, you you as, a, as, a, as a citizen of the United States, I know Lee said there's some international uh, folks on the call. Um, and so um, this, this is particular to... Uh, U.S. citizens have a right to be heard by what's called an Article III court. You also have a right to a jury trial, but you can waive those rights. And that's what the opt out is. The opt out is the opportunity to waive those rights. And then you go, your second question might be, well, wait a minute, wouldn't everyone opt out? And we will also talk about that. I will share statistics with you later to show that has actually not been the case. Yes, there are groups that opt out. Most of the time, it's not companies that opt out. It's individuals. And once again, we'll we'll talk more about that as we as we walk through the slides here. So, um, all right. So uh, let me walk through some more information about the CCB. Right. 
there are three claims officers. Now, these officers are what we would all associated with what judges are. OK, um, so but they call them officers for some reason or not. It's for whatever reason, it's in the legislation like that. And two of the officers have to have real in-depth copyright experience. Right. They have evaluated, litigated, adjudicated infringement claims for both copyright owners and copyright users. And the other officer at least has to have some familiarity with uh, copyright, but has to have some experience in, in ADR with like mediation and alter other types of alternative dispute resolution, okay? Um, so let me go through the show you who the officers are. You've got David Carson, Monica McCabe, and Brad Newberg. Those are the three officers. Uh, and what their functions are, are to render determinations on claims, counterclaims, and defenses that are brought before the CCB, to ensure that claims, counterclaims, and defenses are, one, properly asserted, and two, appropriate for resolution by the CCB. And we'll talk a little bit about that later, because that has proven to be a big, big problem for those people who have filed cases with the, uh, with the CCB. Um, uh, they manage the proceedings, they render rulings, uh, they conduct hearings and conferences to the extent that those are necessary. They will facilitate settlement with by the parties. And our experience has been so far that they've been really good at that because there's quite a few settlements that have come out of this. And once again, we'll talk about that a little bit later. They provide information to the public concerning CCB procedures and requirements, and they maintain the records uh, of the CCB as well, which you can find if you go to the CCB website. Okay, and next you see on your screen the CCB attorneys. So these officers have three attorneys that help them. All the all three of them work all together, so they have all the CCB officers. You see on the on the left hand side Whitney Lewandowski. She is sort of the head attorney, the supervisor attorney advisor. She so she kind of oversees the other uh, two attorney advisors, uh, Maya Burchette and Dan Booth, and all the uh, attorney uh, all the attorneys have uh, experience obviously in copyright. And what their job is to do is really be on the front lines, right? Their job is to assist the CCB officers, but it's also to assist members of the public and specifically potential claimants who are filing. They're, con they're either filing claims or they're considering file claims and they have questions about CCB procedures or CCB requirements. And so that's what they will do. They will try to help those individuals and work with that. And one of the things that they do is they review all the claims that are filed um, with, uh, with the CCB and work with the claimants to amend those claims, make sure they get it right. Remember, a lot of these claimants are not using attorneys, and so they may not get things right the first time. And these are the people who are on the front lines that if you file a claim, you'll be working with them. So now you can, you know, be, if you just get a phone call from them or something, now you can actually put a name and a face together if you are thinking about bringing a, a case before the CCB. All right, so let's go into the real sort of uh, meat and potatoes. Like I said, I'm not going to go and do a deep dive into the, the nitty gritty details, but at a high level, I think you need to know some of these details, right? Because you can't bring just any claim to the Copyright Claims Board. There are three types of claims that you can bring. One is a copyright infringement claim. And to be frank, that is the primary reason the CCB was created, because you had a lot of individual creators and small copyright owners who could not afford federal court and by creating the small claims court this gives them an opportunity to bring their infringement claims before this court uh, or this tribunal i should say um, and so it gives them an opportunity to uh, enforce their rights where they really couldn't afford to before but there are two other types of claims that can be brought one is a declaration of non-infringement so let's say you're not the copyright owner in this particular instance, but someone who is is sort of harassing you or giving you a hard time saying that you're infringing their work and you don't think you are and you want this to stop. You can file what's called a declaration of non-infringement to basically say, hey, look, I want to prove I want to prove that I'm not infringing here. So you can bring a case yourself against the copyright owner to get this declaration of non-infringement. And we'll talk a little bit more in detail about how many of these cases have been filed and, and things like that. And the last one may be a little confusing to folks if they're not familiar with what's called the DMCA, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. I kind of forewarned you at the beginning, there'll be some, there'll be some acronyms here. So, um, and one of them is the DMCA. And, and so the third type of claim that can be brought is this DMCA section 512SF misrepresentation claim. And what that is, is under the DMCA, 
you can send a notice to an ISP, an internet service provider, to say, hey, this person's infringing my stuff. I want you to take it down. And, and I'm the copyright owner. Here's my registration. Whatever information they, they, they need, you send it to them, right? Um, in that notice, if there's a misrepresentation, you're not really the owner. They're not really infringing, something like that. So the, 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 the person can file what's called a misrepresentation claim. Now, there's also someone can file a counter notice to simply say, hey, I'm not infringing and here's why. And they may make some misrepresentations in that counter notice. Uh, and that, that can also be a claim brought before the CCB. Now, I understand that could be a little confusing. And so I'm happy to take any questions uh, sort of at the end or, or uh, if, if folks find that, find that a little confusing. So uh, anyway, the other type of claims that can be brought is or the, in terms of defenses. Anything on this list, these three type of claims can be brought as defenses. For instance, if somebody sues you for a declaration of non-infringement, you can turn around and bring an infringement claim if you're the person that's being sued or any of these, a misrepresentation claim, any, anything like that. Um, fair use, you can bring it as a defense, um, you can bring as well. And so there's a whole bunch of different counterclaims and defenses that you can, you can bring in this context. So then you go, okay, wait a minute, what can I not bring? What type of claims can I not bring? And really it's quite simple. If I didn't name it on the last slide, you can't bring it, right? And so if it's not a permissible claim, you can't bring it. So what are we talking about, right? Um, first of all, it's gotta be a copyright claim. This is a copyright small claims court. So um, you can't bring patent and trademark infringement claims. And you go, you might be thinking, well, who, who the heck's gonna do that? Uh, but people have done it a lot. They just don't understand the distinction between patent, trademark, and copyright necessarily. And they brought quite a few patent infringement claims. Um, Copyright ownership disputes, like you were in a in a dispute with somebody, you say you own something, they say they own it. That the copyright the, the the copyright claims board does not have the resources to deal with that, and it's not listed as a type of permissible claim that can be brought. Similar, the same is true with contractual disputes. That's not to say that if a contract that is issue in the in the in the infringement claim that as you'll hear later from me, you can't bring up bring something up. Uh, but if it's just purely a contractual dispute. The CCB is not going to not going to take the case. All right, so uh, let's talk about representation. I mentioned before that uh, that you don't need an attorney uh, to represent you with the CCB. The idea is that it's simplified, so you don't need uh, a, a counsel. Um, and so you can hire an attorney to represent you, and certainly people have, especially at the very beginning when the when the CCB first opened, a lot a bunch of people did use attorneys. Um, so you do have the option to use an attorney if you want, but you don't have to. You can just bring the case yourself. But you, the other thing to note is that you can also bring the case like with a maybe with a different organization, like a pro bono organization, like uh, a law school clinic, for instance, can represent you uh, or um, uh, uh, or a volunteer lawyers for the arts or anything like that. So there's a whole bunch of different options here uh, for uh, for you to use. I will mention that the Copyright Office itself, if you are thinking about bringing a case and you think, well, wait a minute, I'm not comfortable bringing this myself. I'd love to get some assistance, maybe free assistance. Go to the Copyright Office webpage about the CCB and you will see on the, they have a webpage devoted to organizations that are offering pro bono services for CCB parties. In other words, that means you don't get pro bono, it's free, right? And so, uh, and it will list. You can also go to our website, uh, at the Copyright Alliance, because we list a bunch of different volunteer lawyers for the arts that are located across the country that can help you all out. Um, and so if that's something you're thinking about, but you're too worried about doing it yourself, I would encourage you to investigate these law clinics and and other uh, other other organizations that provide these pro bono services. All right, so how, let's say you decide you do want to bring a claim. How would you go about doing that? Just some very, very high level stuff you go to the ccb.gov, and, and for that matter, anyone who has any questions about anything we've talked about here after the fact, something arises, or you want to learn more about the CCB, I encourage you to go to our site, but certainly go to the Copyright Office's site, and they have a specific area of their site that's do d devoted to the CCB. So go to ccb.gov, um, and you'll find a bunch of information there. But if you wanted to file a claim, you'll also find the place where you can go and file your claim right there and fill it out. Also, if you want to file, you want to look at any of the cases that have been filed, you can go to ccb.gov and they have a listing of all the cases and the claims that have been brought. 
and you can just click on a case and, and, and find out more about it if you're interested. So there's a really just a tremendous amount of very, very interesting and helpful information at ccb.gov, including filing a claim. <clears throat> if you were gonna file a claim, uh, is a total fee of $100. Um, but that $100 payment is separated into two separate payments. And this is something that we really, really pushed for. Um, the first payment is $40. You have to pay that up front. The second payment is $60. And that does not happen unless the CCB takes the case. And as you will hear from me, most of the time the CCB doesn't take the case for one reason or another. And so we knew that was going to happen, And so at, le at least initially. And so we thought, let's split the fee up. And so you pay $40, and if they don't take the case, you're out $40, but at least you're not out $100 because they they they, they will have taken, uh, because they didn't take the case. Um, what happens is once you bring, file the claim through the ccb.gov, the CCB attorneys, the, the three people I showed you earlier, will examine your claims to make sure they meet all the legal requirements. And if they don't meet the legal requirements, guess what? They're going to reach back out to you and say, hey, you made a mistake here. And here's what you need to fix, if it's fixable. Sometimes it might not be fixable, okay? Um, and I'm going to talk about the there's three really big issues that claimants, people who file claims with the CCB are having, and this is one of them. Trying to file claims that are compliant with the CCB, uh, the CCB rules. And I'll, like I said, talk about that a little bit more as we go forward. All right, uh, a couple of other things that you should know. Number one, there's a limit on the number of cases that anyone can bring during a 12-month period. And I won't get into the law firms or sole practitioners, but as a claimant, the, mo the most number of cases you can bring in a 12-month period is 30. That's a lot, quite honestly. Um, there's one group that actually has hit the 30-case limit, um, uh, has filed a lot of claims, and they've been very successful with their use of the CCB. But beyond that, no one's even come remotely close to filing that many claims. The other thing you need to know is there are two types of cl claims in the very general sense that you could bring. One is a standard track claim, which is just, it's just like a standard claim. But the other one is what's called a smaller claim. And the difference is with a smaller claim, the damages are capped even more than the, than the cap for the standard claims. In this, when you file a claim for a smaller claim, the total damages sought must not exceed $5,000. So this is something that a lot of the creators that we work with and individual um, copyright owners that we work with, we're very, very interested in. And we made sure we put that into the law itself. The other difference is instead of the case being decided by the three officers I showed you earlier, only one officer would be selected and they do it kind of randomly, like spin the wheel or something like that. And, and so you never know who, which officer you're going to get, but only one officer is going to uh, uh, decide the case. And then the other very, very important thing is there is no discovery. And that's one of the allures. One of the interesting parts about the small claims, I think why people like it, there's, ve there's really no discovery. And if there is, it's only because the judges and the officers ask for it. And discovery is a process by which you know, the parties share information. They could say, oh, I'd like you to share all your memos on this or your emails on this or something like that. And you have to send them over to the other side. Well, with a smaller claim, there is no, um, there is, there is no discovery whatsoever. All right. Some other things you need to know. Limitations on who, uh, on, on uh, who can, who you can file a claim against. In other words, who can be sued. There are a bunch of parties that are excluded that you cannot sue no matter what, really, right? You see them listed on the slide here. One is library and archives. You cannot sue a library and archive if, this is a big if, if they are on a blanket opt-out list. So there's a list at, at ccb.gov. You go there. There's a list of all the libraries and archives who have opted out saying, I don't want to be sued. If, if, if you think I'm infringing, you can't sue me. And if they're on that list, you can't sue them, okay? The only libraries and archives that that's available to. Um, online service providers, okay? You cannot sue an online service provider for the infringement of someone else that's taking place on their service. Obviously, if an OSP and I is infringing themselves, you can sue them. But if one of their customers, if one of their users is infringing, you cannot sue the ISP unless the ISP refuses to take any action in response to your DMCA notice you remember we talked about the MC notices a little bit before. You cannot sue foreign residents. For those of you who are on the on on this 
uh, webinar right now who are outside the United States, if somebody, well, first of all, you would not be able to sue, be sued under the CCB, right? If you're a foreign resident, foreign, the CCB does not have jurisdiction over foreign residents. There is one big exception to that, right? Which is that foreign residents, even though they can't be respondents, they can't be sued, they can sue. They can use the CCB as claimants and they can sue other people. And if they're going to sue other people, that means they voluntarily have left themselves open to also be, be sued the other way as well in the, in the same case. And then the last group is federal and state government entities. And there's no exception to them. You just can't sue federal and state government entities at the, at the CCB level. So those are the four groups that you cannot bring a suit against. How to serve process. I'm not going to go into detail here. The only reason I have this slide here um, is because you have to notify the respondent, notify the person that they're being sued, just like you do in federal court, right? The problem is for those people who aren't using an attorney, this is a very, very complicated process, okay? And remember I said the number one problem before was non-compliant claims that are being filed. This is number two problem, service of process, okay? Um, a lot of claimants are having problems with this. We did our best. We put together a one pager that tries to explain how you serve process, how you notify someone um, about, uh, uh, you know, a, about the case that you've just filed against them. But it, it, you've got a limited time to do it. And it's somewhat difficult because it differs from state to state to state, depending on what state you're in and what state they're in. And, and so it can be very complicated because you have to figure out what the state law is. What we try to do is simplify it as much as possible, but there's just so much we can do because it is it is quite difficult and a lot of claimants end up kind of having some difficulty with this, okay? All right, but let's assume that the complaint has been approved. You've, 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 you've uh, met that hurdle. You've served the respondent, so you've met that hurdle. What happens next? Then, remember I talked about opt out before, that's when the respondent decides do they want to opt out or do they want to participate uh, in this case? Now, if the respondent opt out, the case is dismissed immediately. It doesn't mean you can then bring a case in federal court. As a matter of fact, a lot of people have started, if they were going to bring the case in federal court, they decide to go to the CCB first uh, and, and then bring the case. And if somebody opts out, then they'll go to federal court. But if the respondent does not opt out, then the case becomes an active proceeding. Okay. Uh, and then what happens next in the proceeding is the officers are going to start to jump in and take some action. They're going to issue a scheduling order. Uh, and so that's what kicks things off. They're going to say, on this date, you have to do this. On this date, you have to do that. You know, just like lays out a schedule for everything. That scheduling order can change over time because things get delayed for one reason or another. Um, they're going to, uh, um, one of the things on the scheduling order is discovery, assuming it's not a small claims case. Okay, they're going to talk at discovery. So discovery is very simple and and compared to federal court. Federal court, federal court is very kind of willy nilly in discovery and small claims court. There are pre uh, uh, approved or or written forms, and each side just fills out their form and gives it to the other side. So even if you don't know anything about discovery, it's it's simplified. It's really just all about asking, answering, asking, and answering the questions that are on the pre-approved pre forms. Um, the, there may be hearings, there may be conferences that don't need to be, but a lot of times there are conferences of some sort by the officers. But like I said before, if there are conferences, they're gonna be done remotely, okay? Now, obviously there's there's a lot more to the process, but that at a very high level is, is, uh, is the process. All right, so uh, then what happens next is not surprisingly, you've gone through this whole process, after discovery, after any hearings, after any conferences are completed, everything is done. The CCB officers look at all that information and they're gonna make a determination uh, or a decision, whatever it's, uh, legally it's called a determination. Now, as I said before, if it's a smaller claims case, only one officer is gonna make that determination. If it's a regular standard case, it's gonna be three officers. So all three are gonna make that uh, determination. And the determinations themselves, They'll be publicly available online. So if anyone wanted to see kind of prior determinations and what the officers said and why they came out the way they did and, you know, to figure out whether you want to use this or not, uh, they're up online at ccb.gov. And so just take a look at them. Um, the determinations themselves are based on the records in the proceeding, not surprisingly. 
uh, judicial precedent, in other words, looking at uh, courts, federal courts, and how they have held in similar type cases, and of course the law, right? You, they have to abide by the law. All right, uh, and then uh, before I start talking about actual statistics, so there's a second part of my uh, discussion here, let me talk a little bit about remedies. Um, so there are no injunctions available. An injunction is the ability to stop somebody doing what they're doing. So what that means is if you sue somebody in federal court and they're infringing your work, you cannot get them to stop. Like the, the CCB will not order them to stop. They don't have the authority to do that simply because they couldn't be granted that authority. However, and this is a huge, huge however, okay? The parties themselves can reach agreement so that one party will cease or mitigate an infringement or other offending activity. And so even though the CCB, the officers cannot themselves issue an injunction, they can, if the parties agree, the parties can go to them and say, okay, this is what we agreed to. And then the CCB will say, okay, we can, we can enforce this. And that's what they'll do. So you can get the same thing as an injunction, but you get to get it sort of a somewhat roundabout way. The parties themselves have to be agreeable. And um, from what we understand, this has happened actually quite, quite, a, quite a bit. So uh, this is uh, helpful. Um, other, uh, other remedies, actual damages and profits, obviously, are, are something that you can get in, in the, the CCB. And there's something called statutory damages. You can also get statutory damages if you go to federal court. But as I mentioned before, damages are capped. And so with actual damages, the most you can get in any one case is $30,000. The same is true for statutory damages, but it's a little bit different. You can get $15,000 per work in statutory damages. So if you have, let's say, two works, you can get 15 for each for a, a, a total of 30,000. But let's say you have one, one, only one work that's infringed, the most you could get would, 15, would be 15,000. You can't get the whole 30,000 in that case, right? So, and that's assuming that you've timely registered your work. I'm not gonna go into what it means to be timely registered now, that would take a whole, you know, 15 minutes or so. But um, uh, if it's untimely registered, then you get basically half of that. So it's 7.5 thousand or 15,000 total, okay? If it's not timely registered, but you do have to register your work uh, in order to, to use a CCB, but you can do it right before. Like you, the work does not need to be registered. You need to at least apply for the registration. Then you can file a CCB case. You cannot bring a CCB case unless the work is is at least, the registration is at least pending. And the other thing I'll mention in terms of statutory damages, willfulness is irrelevant here. Um, it doesn't make uh, any difference whether the person intended to do it or didn't intend to do it, it's, it's, it's irrelevant. And then lastly, as very end of the slide here, um, unlike in federal court where you can get attorney fees or court costs reimbursed to you, you cannot get that at the CCB level. So there's no attorneys, no, no, no court costs. The one exception is if somebody brings a case in bad faith or fails to prosecute or, or, or make, bring some defense in very fair uh, in bad faith or something like that, in that case, you could potentially get attorney's fees or court, co court costs back. All right, so let me see how I'm doing on time. I, I should be able to do, get through the next bunch of slides in 10 or 15 minutes here. So um, let's let's look at the last 18 months. Let's look at the CCB's around, been around for 18 months. We have some experiences. We kind of know what's working and what's not working um, and what could be working better, uh, that, that type of thing. And so uh, as, an, as an overview, and then I'll go through the stats, I've got a bunch of information here. Uh, the average number of cases is 1.2 cases filed per day. So uh, which, and, and it's been pretty, pretty consistent. Uh, this stat under it is actually wrong. It says 30% are smaller came, claims. Because we, I did this slide a few months ago, and it's now up to 42. And we'll talk about that in a moment. 30% um, of the cases, the claimant is using legal counsel. Um, in uh, Infringement claims represent an overwhelming majority of the claims. Uh, the vis works of visual arts, similarly, uh, are the majority of the cases. And so far, we have 12 determinations and 48 active proceedings, okay? So that at a very high level is kind of our experiences with the CCB so far, but really to understand what's working, what's not, and, and what you might want to know if you're considering filing a case or not, um, let's, let's do a little bit deeper dive here. Um, and so uh, I put together this chart here to show 
since the CCP was launched, June 16, 2022, until a couple of weeks ago, November 28th, 2023, you can see that the number of cases filed, there's 679 total filings, and you can see very consistently, right, that the cases are filed a, a little over one a day. Now, at the very beginning, not surprisingly, when the CCB first opens a door, its doors, there were a lot more cases filed at the beginning. You see that a little bit steeper uh, up until, let's say, September or so. Um, and then it takes a little bit of a dip and where it's is fairly consistent again. Um, and then you see little dips, like, for instance, August in 23, you'll see a dip. You see a little dip in December 2022, you know, right around the holidays when you know, people going away, things like that. You see what, what are somewhat natural dips, I think, in terms of the number of filings. But it's remarkable, I think, how consistent the number of filings have, have been uh, over, over time. All right. This next slide shows the nature of the claims, what's being filed. OK, so you can see that the total number of claims, infringement claims, is 605. Uh, very, very few non-infringement claims. That's the yellow circle there where you have 22 non-infringement claims uh, and then 56 misrepresentation, or sorry, 121 misrepresentation claims. Now, what you see in the middle here, the zero, the seven, the five, the 44, those are claims, though that's where it overlaps. So for instance, you have 44 cases in which someone filed both a misrepresentation claim and an infringement claim, right? Um, you have five cases where somebody filed a misrepresentation claim and an infringement claim, okay? So obviously you have zero where somebody's filed an infringement and a non-infringement claim. You say, you just can't do that, right? That's not, not, not possible. Um, so uh, anyway, that gives you a flavor of how the CCB is being used overwhelmingly, not surprisingly, it is being used to file infringement claims. This next slide shows what type of works are being uh, identified by the claimant. In other words, as, as being in, usually being infringed. Um, we thought going in that works of visual arts would represent uh, the vast majority of cases here. To our surprise, it's not as high as we thought. We thought it might be around 60%. It's about 42%. So that shows that other uh, types of creators, other types of copyright owners are using the CCB. And most importantly for, for you all, of course, is you see literary works, <clears throat> excuse me, at 13% representing. So if you take away visual arts, I mean, visual literary works are right up there with motion picture, sound recordings, all within the same, you know, within the within the same, same realm here. Uh, here on this slide, you see uh, the division between smaller claims and standard track claims. Um, uh, and, uh, Standard track claims represent 58% of the claims. Smaller claims are 42. Now, you remember that slide I had before where I told you there was an error on it. It's a 30, 30%. This is the one big change that's starting to happen over the last several months is that more and more smaller claims are being filed as opposed to these standard track claims because people have found they, they're supposed to move through the system quicker. They're supposed to be easier to file, all that stuff. So, um, so, so anyway, uh, smaller claims is rapidly increasing. I wouldn't be surprised that if I give the same presentation or similar presentation, let's say six months from now, you'll see that number of 42%, maybe even out, maybe even overtake standard track claims. I, I think that's kind of interesting and, and we're really glad we, we, we put that in there in the, in the law. Um, all right, so remember I mentioned the very first problem about compliance review and and making sure these claims are compliant that these people are filing. So I'm gonna take a little bit more time on these next two slides because this explains what's going on here, okay? So on this slide, you see there are 679 cases, right? We just mentioned that. Of those 679 cases, <clears throat> excuse me, 337 were found to be compliant and 246 were found to be not compliant during during the attorney's review process. Now, obviously 337 and 246 does not add up to 679 because there are other cases that are dismissed for other reasons, so they're not on here. We'll talk about those in a moment. Um, so, but you can see 246, that's a relatively big number. Um, and so it's got us concerned and obviously the CCB concerned and we go, well, okay, well, why is this? Is there something we can do? Is there something we can, so people file more compliant claims 
And to some extent, it might be because the whole system is new. You know, we've got educational material up there, the Copyright Office does, but slowly but surely, trade associations, other organizations starting to put educational material up there. So, um, you, you, you know, you'll see, uh, hopefully people will become more educated as things move on. So, uh, so let's talk about why these cases are being dismissed. As I mentioned, in the first instance, one of the reasons is 246 cases have been uh, dismissed because of compliant, it failed compliance review. And one of the things I spoke to some of the officers a couple of weeks ago, and they don't know, like, why, why is it that claimants are being are, are either not able to fix their claims or in a lot of cases, they're just not responding. Like the officers will reach out to them and say, you need to fix this. And then they won't. Now, part of the reason could be that they've settled the case. OK, that's probably unlikely, but it's possible. Um, another could be that they it's not possible for them uh, to, to fix the case. Like, for instance, remember, I, I, I talked about those parties you can't sue, let's say, like a foreign resident. Well, let's say they put a foreign resident in there. Well, there's no way for them to fix that. Right. And so that's part of it, too. Or maybe they realize, oh, I, I filed a patent claim or maybe they realize, oh, maybe it's, this is not infringement that's happening or some reason. So there might be very legitimate reasons uh, that they're not. But for some reason, I think that's something we need to get to get to know a little bit more about. Another reason I've mentioned a big problem, this was, uh, I think, the very first problem I mentioned, is that the claimant didn't file a valid proof of service. After you serve somebody, then you need to file proof of service with the CCB, and that's just not happening, right? There's 88 instances where that's not happening. Now, in some cases, they may be serving the other side, and the other side says, hey, wait a minute, wait a minute, let's not do this. Let's see if we can reach settlement, and they reach settlement, and that would be a great thing if that's if that's the case. We just We just don't know if that's the case or not. I think in more instances, uh, they're just having a problem with service of process. In 77 instances, the claimant requested to withdraw or dismiss the case. And they do know, the CCB knows, of these 77 cases, 39 cases were withdrawn because they settled. And that's a wonderful thing, right? These cases weren't going to settle before there was when there was no CCB, but now that they were able to reach some type of settlement. I'm willing to bet that even more than 39 cases resulted in settlement. There is no duty to tell the CCB that you settled the case. So that's why when I say we just don't know if they settled or not, um, uh, you know, that they may have settled and we just don't know. And I think that 39 is probably a little a little low. That's only the, the cases where the CCB is notified that there's been a settlement. In 59 cases, the, there's been opt out. That's a very small percentage, I think at least of all the 679 cases. So in only 59 instances have people opted out. In many instances, corporations are not opting out because they feel it's better to proceed at the CCB level where the risks are lower. Their insurance companies might require them to not opt out, who knows. Um, but a lot of times corporations are not opting out because they're just using their own in-house counsel as opposed to hiring outside counsel if they went to federal court. Um, uh, nine cases were rejected because registration was rejected, right? Remember, you had to have a copyright registration to proceed. And then others, 15 for other just miscellaneous reasons, it's not worth kind of going into. So this is a big issue that hopefully will get better over time. Uh, and then I know we're running close on time and I want to be able to take questions. So let me run through these real quick. Um, uh, here you see a chart about self-representation. As I said before, most instances, um, uh, the uh, uh, claimants are representing themselves, right? And in, in 395 of the cases, but people are represented by outside counsel or maybe in-house attorney or lost, very few cases with law students. Hopefully that will increase as well. So uh, you get some perspective there. Uh, here is a list of the cases uh, filed per state by within each state. Um, I don't think there's any big surprises here, right? Big states where there's a lot of copyright owners too. California, New York, Texas, Pennsylvania, maybe Florida. Washington's a little bit of an outlier maybe, but in Florida um, uh, are up there certainly. So that, no, no big surprises here. Um, country of residence. So this is a little surprising, I have to say. We did not think that foreign residents would use the CCB nearly as much as they are. And you can see 30 cases from the UK, 10 from Germany, eight from China. Um, now remember, these foreign residents can own, they can be sue as claimants. You cannot sue them as residents. And so anyway, I found this, uh, I found I think this this information is a little interesting. Um, and then let's talk about the determinations. 
Uh, there are 12 final determinations so far. Eight of them are default determinations. What that means is, is the claimant or the respondent like didn't show up, right? Didn't 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 respond to anything, or they maybe they did respond initially, but then they don't respond after that. And so these cases get resolved by the CCB officers as quote unquote default determinations. That doesn't mean just because it's a default determination that the claimant automatically wins because the other side didn't show up. It, what it means is the CCB still closely examines the case. They'll look at all the facts. It's just that the respondent has not made their own case. And so any facts that might be favorable to the respondent that the CCB just otherwise doesn't know, there's nothing they can do about that, right? And so uh, the CCB will not automatically just decide in favor of the claimant where there's a default. So that's something to that's something something to to know. Um, in terms of damages in these cases, relatively small amounts. It is a small claims court af after all. You know, you can see on the left hand side the lowest award a thousand, the highest award nine thousand, uh, average award of uh, of three thousand, et cetera. So you get some uh, some perspective here. More and more, this will start to change over time. And, but we just haven't been doing this long enough to get some, that, that perspective. One thing I will say is one of the, there was some opposition to do, creating the CCB and the opposition was that there'd be all these copyright trolls and the CCB we would be awarding $30,000 all the time. And, and as you can see, that just is not happening. You're not seeing copyright troll problem. You're not seeing tremendously large awards and things like that. Um, certainly where a large award were warranted, you'd see it, but um, but that just hasn't hasn't happened yet. And then, uh, and then lastly, I just wanted to point out that we went through, looked at a bunch of cases involving individual publishers uh, and smaller publishers. And you can see here, I've got it on two slides because we've got uh, 10 cases. There's a few, a couple others we didn't put on here, but, but 10 cases here. And um, what you'll see from these cases is, um, uh, is, is the split sometimes Small publishers are claimants and sometimes the respondents almost exactly split down the middle. Um, the most common claim seems to be that uh, uh, publishers being sued uh, because the uh, there's for selling copies without permission because the agreement has ended. Uh, here's the other five cases that we put up here. Um, and consistent with what we've been talking about before, a lot of these cases have been, have been dismissed. Very few. I point out that the one at the very end uh, resulted in a settlement. So um, it really does. I think that the, the, these cases are pretty typical of the cases that we've been we've been seeing. And then just to wrap things up here, um, uh, I want to direct you to our website. Uh, and and on the website, if you go to what I uh, think is sort of red, I've been told is supposed to be pink. Maybe I'm colorblind. <laughs> but anyway, uh, all the way to the right under the education um, uh, uh, navigation uh, if you pull down, you'll see something that says CCB Explained. And we have tons of videos, tons of FAQs, tons of information on the CCB. So I encourage you, any questions you have the CCB that we don't answer today, to check that out. Go to the orange section, all the way to the right, the get where it says Get Involved, um, and take a look. You can join, if you're an individual as opposed to a company, you can join, get information about copyright for free. Um, you see that, so just pull down where it says Join the Alliance. You can sign up, whether you're a corporation or an individual, to get our CCB newsletter. See at the very sort of second to the bottom there where it says CCB alert. Uh, you can also sign up to get policy alerts here where that's right above the CCB alerts. Um, and so there's a ton of information you can get, honestly, without spending a dime with us if you're interested. So I encourage you that you might want be, to be able to do that. So I know we've, we've uh, kind of hit up on it. I did have a slide in case people wanted to talk about or I had enough time to talk about copyright and artificial intelligence, uh, but I might uh, just sort of skip that uh, unless of course we don't have questions or not a lot of questions and then I'm happy to go back to this um, because I know it's a big issue, but I'm also happy to come back some other time because there's a lot of artificial intelligence issues that folks wanna talk about, uh, I know, and I'm, I'm happy to, I'd be happy to talk about that as well. So why don't, uh, I think I've hit, hit man, about a minute over, I think. Yeah, but we're, I'm pretty we're close. great, so I'm Keith. Up for we, do have a couple, we do have a couple of questions. Um, uh, let's start with one from James. If a respondent opts out, can that result in a default determination? Or um, it just will never go through because they, they've opted out? Yeah, that's correct. It will never go through because they've opted out. So it's um, it's never an active case. So you can't have a default determination if somebody has opted out. And um, 
so once the CCB makes a ruling, um, is it uh, does that preclude any future federal court um, uh, case on the same infringement claim? So uh, primarily, yes. The one difference is, is if they issue a decision and yet the respondent doesn't comply with that, right? Then the claimant can go to federal court and get that enforced. And it's possible that the court might not only enforce that, but might also just say, and you have to pay the other side's attorney's fees because they come to federal court and blah, blah, blah. You know, it's possible. I don't know. We haven't had a case do that yet. So that is possible. But no, I mean, you are bound by the CCB decision once uh, once it once it comes out, as a so you can't. It's like you can't stew again if you don't like the answer or something. Yeah, I mean that was something we had talked about when we were talking about the Case Act and getting the law passed, and and it would kind of defeat the purpose of the CCB is if respondents or claimants could then go to the federal court if they didn't like the decision. I don't think a lot of people would use the CCB if that were the case. So yeah, you, you're kind of, for better or worse, you were stuck with the CCB decision. And is, do you feel like the um, the low the relatively low amount of risk, uh, like it, the, the the most is fifteen thousand for a single work infringement, like the, the thirty for a case. Do you feel like that's the motivator for people to not opt out because they feel like their exposure, even in, even if they lose, their exposure is more limited than in a federal case where the numbers get, it gets so expensive so quickly. I think that's that is a lot to do with it. There are a whole bunch of other reasons, like for instance. If you're a company, your insurance might require you because the risk is so low, right? Might say, no, 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 we're not taking the chance of going to federal court. You have to, and if you have ins infringement insurance, they may require that. The process is supposed to be a lot quicker than federal court. That, let's say if you've got a big project you don't want to hold up, that might be advantageous uh, for you to do. So there's a bunch of different reasons. I will mention that what we've heard from corporations so far is that they, their in-house counsel like doing these cases, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so they don't have to hire outside counsel. It's easy enough they can do it themselves. Uh, and so they save some money that way. They actually enjoy it. You know, it's a way for them to litigate without litigating, uh, in essence. So it's interesting. A lot of companies have not opted out because of that, especially, you know, that have inside in-house counsel. So there's a bunch of different reasons. I will mention one other reason that somebody, I got a call from somebody, they were trying to figure out whether to opt out or not, because they said, we're goddamn sick of this person accusing us of infringement and going on social media and doing it and making us look bad. So we're going to not opt out so we can prove them wrong, right? And so anyway, so there's a whole bunch of different reasons that I think companies or individuals are not opting out. Cool. Thanks. Um, Cecilia is asking, does the Copyright Alliance also get involved in lobbying non-governmental entities like Amazon and YouTube whose policies affect publishers and creators? So, yeah, I wouldn't use the word lobbying. Or do we talk to them and try to get them to do the right thing? I'll say absolutely. Um, we have been in very detailed conversations for, with, for instance, with Amazon, uh, um, uh, let me see, Google, Meta. Uh, it's unfortunate that, uh, you know, all the companies I just mentioned end up laying off a bunch of people. And the first group to go generally were the people, the anti-piracy type people, right? The, the people that we need to work with. And so it's been very difficult since that time to get them to, it, it was difficult before when those people were in place to get them to do anything and to respond to our concerns. And since then, I mean, it's just silence because they just don't have the staff over there anymore, unfortunately. But we do, we do work with them. And I'm always interested to hear about problems that people might have uh, with those groups and to see if we can mention it to them and see if they'll take any action. Um, Jackie has a question about um, what are the resources for a content publisher to um, accurately value their content for a claim case? Like how does how does how does that valuation work, or are there tools to help you figure out the valuation? So we're working on that, and and so you know what? I just realized I never got to problem number three, issue number three, and that is issue number three is that. Um, the uh, claimants are having trouble when they prevail in the case. Now, there haven't been that many cases that have gotten this far. But when they prevail in the case, they then have to prove damages and show what their damages might be. And a lot of claimants are having difficulty with that. And so uh, I would say look for our on our website and also I think the CCB website, too, because they realize this is a this is a problem that we've just become aware of within the last couple of months. And so we're going to put up information in a blog and up on our CCB uh, part of our website to explain kind of what 
uh, what parties can do to, to, to show like how much they should get in damages. In other words, what the valuation of the infringement, what the valuation of the work is. It is, it is difficult to do, but we're going to work with some experts in the area and, and try to provide some meat to the bones on that. So, so kind of stay tuned for that. That's the best answer I can give. Cool. Um, Russell has a question um, that I don't completely understand, but I'm just going to pass it on to you and hopefully you understand <laughs> it. Uh, what oversight does the Registrar of Copyright have over the CCOs and the final determinations? So um, it's it's interesting that I, I don't get too too in the weeds here, right? Because the the Register of the Copyright Office is not a presidential appointee. So for legal, like constitutional reasons, it's not the register that has the final say in terms of whether an officer should be released or reprimanded or whatever the case may, excuse me, may be. The Librarian of Congress does. So the Copyright Office is in the Library of Congress. The register reports to the Librarian of Congress. The Librarian of Congress is a presidential appointee. And so for constitutional reasons, it's got to be the librarian who has oversight, ultimate oversight, I should say, over the officers. The register clearly does as well, and the librarian's gonna take the register's advice, <clears throat> but ultimately the decision is made by the librarian itself. I, that's a very, very complex question um, that would require a whole separate webinar, I think. And we've done- It's still very webinars. inside baseball, but yeah, I wanted yeah. to pass it along. Yeah. Um, we do have a question that's very specific to somebody's um, uh, uh, specific situation. And so I, I I, I will share it with the caveat that you can say this is too specific. I can't That's fine. That's comment fine. on it, but um, uh, the person is asking, um, they discovered the infringement of their novel watching the film from the novel. The writer of the novel is the person they mostly hold responsible. Do they have to file a copyright against the holders of the film too? Are statutory limits in play if I don't file against the makers of the film? The novel was published three or four years before the film. Yeah, so that is a very, very, very specific factual scenario because one thing you didn't mention there is a the screenplay, right? It's like, well, we don't know who wrote the screenplay or where. And so uh, honestly, that is the type of claim. Obviously, I can't give any advice, period, legal advice. I can provide information. And, and so that's the type of claim that does seem sufficiently convoluted that you probably would want to speak to some type of legal counsel, whether it's volunteer lawyers for the arts, someone at a law firm, if you have in-house counsel, in-house counsel, somebody like that, because factually that seems really kind of, there are, in addition to the people that you, the groups that you mentioned, there may even be others. And so uh, you'd want to consider, the, depending on how this kind of panned out. So yeah, I think you'd want to seek advice because that's very, very factually specific. Yeah, cool. I, I expected that. Yeah. Um, uh, I, there's one more question. Um, from uh, AV, uh, before filing uh, with the Copyright Claims Board, can this person communicate to the respondent that if the respondent opts out, they will immediately proceed filing an infringement claim in federal court? To sort of like, well, yeah. to kind of pressure them to not opt out. So not only can they, to be honest, I would recommend that. If that's, the, if that's truly what, uh, not just uh, an empty thread, right? If they're, if, if this is their process to go, okay, we're going to try the CCD first. Let's, let's do this with easy way before we do it the hard way. It's beneficial to everyone. Um, I, yeah, I would absolutely suggest uh, that that's a good idea across, across the board. But like I said, it has to be an, it can't be just an empty threat. You have to be willing to sort of follow up on that. And, and, uh, but because that will hopefully expedite maybe even just settlement discussions. Right. And so you won't have to go to either of them and ho hopefully that would be the case. Keith, um, I want to ask if we can keep you for five more minutes because we have a lot of people that really want you to comment on AI and copyright infringement. I'm, um, I'm I, I loving it. Have, absolutely happy to do it. Please. Um, what, what, we know that you can't. Yeah, tell tell us what you think are the big the big things we should be thinking about in terms of AI and copyright. So the two biggest issues are in what we call ingestion of copyrighted works and copyrightability. Now, by ingestion, I mean the process by which AI companies, I'll just use the term generically, AI companies go out and ingest, copy, uh, uh, scrape, whatever word you want to use, copyrighted works that are 
on uh, on the internet, someplace else. They'll scrape them, they copy them, and they use them to train their AI systems. Okay. Um, and steal is a verb I've heard quite a bit. <laughs> uh, yeah. So 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 um, they, and they, the problem is they're doing it without authority, without compensation, right? Um, of the underlying from the underlying copyright owner. Now that is not true. To be clear, that is not true of all AI companies. You've got different AI companies. There was one I read about the other day that's doing this in music and um, that just use very definitive data sets where they are compensating everyone, all the works that are used, or they have licenses to use all the works and stuff like that. Um, but you know, be careful too, because like we're on Zoom, right? I mean, Zoom has this little checkbox that says something like, you allow us to use your dialogue and transcripts for our AI engine and you know stuff like that. And so a lot of these services, Zoom is Zoom is one. I forget there was one other I saw this morning. Do that time to check the check the boxing. So ingestion is a big issue, a really really big issue. Uh, the other issue is copyrightability, and the copyright office is trying to figure out what the rules of the road should be when you use AI. Now, if you use AI and only AI, there's no human involvement. I think that's pretty clear that that is not going to be protectable. Um, but if you are using AI, let's say you just need some help with characters or um, uh, or settings or who knows what, or punctuation maybe, right? Okay, what does that mean? What's protectable, what's not? The Copyright Office issued some guidance back in, I think it was March of, of this year. There's a whole section on the Copyright Office website devoted to AI and copyright. So anyone who's confused, I encourage you to, to go to that website so you can be more confused because you will be because the guidance is helpful to an extent, but then it gets a little murky and the copyright office knows this and the copyright office is going to try to update their guidance. Um, they're doing the best they can because they're trying to understand this just like we are all doing it. I will tell you, and let me, I have some statistics here and then I'll stop talking. Um, there are 300 registration applications the Copyright Office has received, or a little bit over, I think, that have disclosed or disclaimed AI. Of those 300, 100 were registered. Of those 100, 86 were literary works. So that tells you most of the copyrighted works that are being submitted for registration that use AI are actually literary works. So that's something you all might be most interested in. Um, uh, and anyway, so that's the rest are mostly visual arts and things like that. And of the 300, a lot of them didn't respond. Like, so don't think like, oh, 200 are rejected. A lot just didn't didn't respond for one reason or another. And maybe they, as they, they, they learned about the guidance and they read it and go, oh, oh, we can't apply here or something. Who knows? But it does seem like literary works are at the head of the class when it comes to use of AI. But that's something we we all need to continue to watch. Those are the two biggest issues. We are doing our darndest to make sure that copyright owners and creators are going to be compensated and ask permission when their works are used to train AI. We've been up on Capitol Hill to do that. There have been like 15 cases or so filed uh, in the courts, not that we're involved in any of them, but they're all proceeding at different different paces. So anyway, that's th those are the two biggest issues. Very, very quickly, the one thing I didn't mention is uh, is when AI produces something that looks similar to something that you produce, right? Um, the odds of that honestly are fairly slim if the AI is, if the AI company is doing the right thing, if they have safeguards to prevent searches for in the style of and, and, and other type of safeguards. So we don't focus on that as much. We do focus on it, but not nearly as much as ingestion or the copyrightability issue. Cool. Thanks. We have one, one last question that just squeaked in under the, under the ribbon. Um, if both parties agree to the uh, Copyright Claims Board um, uh, process, uh, how active is, is, the, is the Copyright Claims Board actively engaged in mediating the case? Or is that really, um, for it to settle, that's really something that the, the two parties end up doing independently? Uh, it can be either. Um, the parties can do it independently. The, at, at some point, the officer probably will ask, do you think you know, would you be amenable to settlement or the parties can go to the officer and say, hey, can you help us settle this case? We think we might be able to settle. Can you help us? Um, so there's a whole bunch of different opportunities. And from what I understand that the parties have been very receptive to that approach, to the settlement approach. We've seen a lot of settlements so far. Uh, at least a few at this point have been assisted by the officers themselves. And so 
uh, the hope is, I mean, when we first created this thing, we assumed this is a small claims court in the UK. And what we were seeing out of the small claims court in the UK is a lot of settlements, like two thirds of the case is end up settling. And so the, their small claims court's a little bit different, um, but uh, but we anticipated we see a lot of settlements and we and we slowly are starting to see that. Cool. I'm sorry. There was a, yet another question that's that snuck in, um, but about use of AI. Um, so this is a publisher, and they're asking when they hire a cover artist, and the cover artist has used a mix of AI and new stuff, but the publisher has no idea and puts it on the book. Yeah. Um, they're concerned about what that means in terms of, I guess, copyright and exposure. Yeah, that is honestly, when we deal with sort of business type question, you know, that's the question we get more than that type of question, more than anything else. And honestly, your contracts are gonna have to change, right? You're gonna have transparency, to- Transparency, like, right? Yeah, You're gonna have to demand good, transparency. Yeah, there's gonna be some level of transparency that the creator is gonna need to say, yes, I created this myself, or if you, they didn't, that yes, I used AI, and this is what I used AI for, because you're paying them to create something, presumably, and uh, as opposed to AI doing it. And so, yeah, I think a lot of publishers, book publishers, you know, music, you name it, are all trying are just in the process of figuring it out. And I know some trade associations have helped by providing like a model provision that you can put into contracts and stuff like that. So that's something that might be a, a possibility. Excellent. Keith, you've been so kind and generous with your time and your information. Thank you so much for everyone watching the recording. Thanks for uh, tuning in. We hope you'll join us in 2024. Um, we actually are, have, are just, I guess I'll announce it here, but we are about to announce that um, once again, all of these monthly educational webinars will be free for IBPM members. So uh, if you're not yet a member, we hope you'll check it out. Um, and also uh, check out all the cool uh, things that the Copyright Alliance offers. Um, and with that, I will stop the recording. All right.